I'm Martin Sheen. There are two major dangers we're facing right now, and they're more closely connected to each other than we usually realize. They are not terrorism or immigrants or socialism. Think much larger. I'm talking about serious dangers on a global scale. One of the two dangers we talk about a lot more than the other. Addressing one of them involves some tough sacrifices well worth making. Addressing the other has no downsides, but we've been trained to imagine it does. The first danger is environmental and climate collapse. The second is nuclear war. We talk more and more about the first one, thank goodness, and less and less about the second to our grave peril. The reality is that the danger from both has never been greater. More nations than ever before have nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. We understand more than ever before that even a small-scale nuclear war in one part of the globe could create a nuclear winter, killing off crops worldwide. Communications between the two big nuclear powers have broken off. Disarmament agreements have been abandoned, and the acceptability of hostility towards Russia in U.S. society is rising. A new treaty bans nuclear weapons, but the nuclear nations are not supporting it because they are locked into the logic of war. It's a logic with faulty premises. Halting environmental destruction does require some changes in how we live, changes dramatically worth making to preserve our ecosystems. Ending all war and all preparations for war does not, contrary to common belief, have any downsides. The problems of climate and the problems of war are intimately related. Wars are fought over fossil fuels and fought with fossil fuels. Wars in recent years have rendered large areas of the world uninhabitable and generated tens of millions of refugees. War and preparations for war damage the environment through the production and testing of nuclear weapons, the aerial and naval bombardment of terrain, the dispersal and persistence of landmines and buried ordnance, and the use and storage of military despoliants, toxins, and wastes. Yet environmental treaties have exempted militarism. As the environmental crisis worsens, thinking of war as a tool with which to address it Treating refugees as akin to military enemies threatens us with the ultimate vicious cycle. Declaring that climate change causes wars misses the reality that we human beings cause war, and that unless we learn to address crises nonviolently, we will only make them worse. The launching of wars by wealthy nations in poor ones does not correlate with human rights violations or lack of democracy or threats of terrorism, but does in fact strongly correlate with the presence of oil. War does most of its environmental damage where it happens, but also devastates the natural environment of military bases in foreign and home nations. The U.S. military is, for example, the third largest polluter of U.S. waterways. Then there's the money problem. A Green New Deal could be funded by taxing corporations and billionaires or by opening public banks, but it makes very little sense not to take at least a good chunk of the necessary funding from the military budget. Taking some of it away is a very popular policy now, and it's money that's being used to do extensive environmental damage that has no upside. While war kills, injures, traumatizes, and destroys on an unrivaled scale, it does far more damage by simply diverting money from other projects that could be used to save and improve lives. The world spends about $2 trillion every year on war and preparations for war, not counting the cost of the damage done by wars or the cost of lost economic opportunities. According to the United Nations figures, 1.5% of that funding could end starvation worldwide. Imagine the reduction in hostility that would be directed at the government that chose to end starvation worldwide. And about 0.6% of military spending could end the lack of clean drinking water worldwide. We have it easily, I mean truly easily, within our grasp to end diseases and suffering on a massive worldwide scale. About half of that $2 trillion every year comes from one government alone. The U.S. government, across numerous departments, puts about $1 trillion every year, over half of its discretionary spending, into war and preparations for more wars. 
The Gallup and Pew polls in recent years have found people in many countries ranking the United States as the top threat to world peace. Terrorism has predictably increased during the war on terrorism as measured by the Global Terrorism Index. Almost all, 99.5% of terrorist attacks occur in countries engaged in wars and or engaged in abuses such as imprisonment without trial, torture, or lawless killing. The highest rates of terrorism are in so-called liberated Iraq and Afghanistan. 95% of all suicide terrorist attacks are conducted to encourage foreign occupiers to leave the terrorists' home country. Numerous just-retired top U.S. officials swear that the various wars they've been involved in have been counterproductive on their own terms. The idea of completely reversing course and abolishing a military frightens a lot of people, and of course it couldn't be done overnight. So here's an idea. With the United States as the top weapons supplier to the globe, with many wars using U.S. weapons on both sides, with more and better jobs possible through conversion to a peaceful economy that aids all workers in the transition, why not stop selling weapons to the world, or at least to the world's worst dictatorships? With U.S. military bases encircling the globe, costing a fortune and provoking danger, while U.S. planes can reach anywhere from the United States, why not close these foreign bases, or at least the ones in the worst dictatorships? With U.S. and allies' military spending reaching three-quarters of the world's, why not limit U.S. military spending to no more than three times the next biggest spender? Because here's the thing. When the United States spends more while threatening China, China spends more. When the United States spends less, China spends less. Russia already spends less each year. A reverse arms race just needs a spark. And a reverse arms race gradually makes continuing a reverse arms race or peace race more acceptable to all sides. Peace is a powerful word. Peace. Think about it. Think about what it means simply in terms of redirecting trillions of dollars. Instead of endless, pointless wars, we could choose a massive campaign of green energy and transitions to sustainable practices in wealthy and poor countries alike, plus clean water and food and housing and education as rights rather than privileges, plus an end to college debt. Wealthy countries providing schools and medicines everywhere could be beloved rather than hated by poor countries and at the same time provide much better services to their own people and at the same time cut taxes for working people and reduce government expenses. This may sound like magic, but it only lacks political will. Politicians have known this choice was available for many years. Listen to what President Dwight David Eisenhower said. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. concluded, quote, A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom, close quote. And President Eisenhower also said, quote, I like to believe that one day the people of the world will want peace so much that the governments of the world will have to get out of the way and let them have it, close quote. Now there is an idea whose time has finally come. Beyond moving funding to human and environmental needs, the U.S. government must begin pursuing a different way of engaging with the world. Begin joining and abiding by human rights treaties and disarmament treaties, Support the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. Engage in open, public, cooperative diplomacy. 
democratize and strengthen the United Nations, invest in unarmed nonviolent peace forces, shift advertising and recruiting budgets from promoting militarism to promoting nonviolent peacemaking. How do we take steps to make this idea real? Consider taking this one, already taken by many people in most countries on Earth, and World Beyond War will work with you on the next steps. Here's what you can do. You go to worldbeyondwar.org and add your name to the following Declaration of Peace, as I have. Quote, I understand that wars and militarism make us less safe rather than protect us, that they kill, injure, and traumatize adults, children, and infants, severely damage the natural environment, erode civil liberties, and drain our economies, siphoning resources from life-affirming activities. I commit to engage in and support nonviolent efforts to end all war and preparations for war and to create a sustainable and just peace. Thank you for watching this video. Again, I'm Martin Sheen. Peace be with you.